God causes things that seemingly have no benefit. Once he puts it in his blender, for those who are following him in the midst of what does not seem rational, fair, what it seems problematic and difficult, he puts them in his blender and begins to cook up something. He begins to cook up something that brings him glory and brings you good. Many of us stood up this morning because we're going through something that is defeating in nature. It's, it's beating us up and it's wearing us down. And we feel like we are the defeated Christian. Many of you did not have to stand this week. You'll be standing next week because something will happen that won't be in your favor. And many Christians today are going through discouragement and see themselves more as victims than victors. I want to introduce you to one of the most famous and fascinating scriptures in all of the New Testament on victory. For those who are going through right now and need victory, and those who will need it sooner or later. The chapter is Romans chapter 8. And Paul in this particular chapter uniquely talks about this thing called victory. In fact, he introduces us to a word that's never used in the Bible except in this passage. It is the only place this word is used. The word is found in verse 37. Verse 37 reads, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. The word overwhelmingly conquer is one Greek word that's only used in this passage and it means to be a super victor. It's like Superman. It's, it's like um, Iron Man. It's like Mighty Mouse. <laughs> These aren't just victors, but they are. They set the tone. They set the temperature. They set the, the momentum. They set the, de uh, the direction. So the, the idea of overwhelming conqueror, a word never used in the Bible except here in verse 37, where God says to his people, you're not just supposed to be a victor, you're supposed to be a super victor. You shouldn't be just getting by. He says you should be overwhelmingly winning. You should be not just okay, you should be slamming it. Overwhelming conqueror, super victor is the word used here. Now, in order to conquer something, you need something to conquer. When I play basketball by myself, I always win. I have never lost to me. And that is because when I'm playing by myself, there's nobody to overcome. Nobody in my face, nobody trying to block the the shot, nobody trying to, to, to block my sight line, nobody trying to stop me driving to the basket. I, I have never failed to successfully drive to the basket when I'm playing by myself because there's nobody to hinder me. But to be an overwhelming conqueror is to conquer something in the face of being opposed, in the face of something that is in my face trying to block my progress. This is the environment in which this chapter was written. Verse 17 of Romans 8, he says, And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. He talks about two kinds of Christians here. He talks about children who are heirs and sufferers who are co-heirs. See that in the verse? 
He says, if you're a child, you're an heir. You bear the inheritance of the father as a child of God. You're a child, you're children. But then he says, if you're suffering, you are co-heir. You can be an heir, but not necessarily a co-heir. Because co-heir is tied to suffering. Heir is tied to sonship. So if you are a Christian today, if you have trusted Jesus Christ, you are an heir of God. You have an eternal inheritance. If you are going through the pains, problems, difficulties, struggles, defeats of life, then Jesus Christ is now inviting you to become a co-heir. A co-heir is more than an heir. You can have a child who's your child who's not necessarily in your will. They, they are born a child. But to be a co-heir, to, to, to be a recipient of the benefits of heirship. The benefits of heirship. So, so he wants to talk to them on a deeper level about being co-heirs, not being heirs. Here's the difference. If you are a child of God and therefore an heir, you go from earth to heaven. Heaven is your guaranteed right as a child of God. If you are a co-heir through the time of suffering, we'll talk about that in a moment, you not only go to heaven, heaven comes to you. Co-heirship brings about a different dimension of experience of God as you go through suffering which is tied to coercion. From verses 17 to verse 27, he talks about groaning. You'll see that word groaning show up in those verses. Our time will not let us spend time there. But if you were to read, he talks about groaning, the aches and pains of life. He talks about even nature groaning, earthquakes, tsunamis, he said, the aches and pains of creation. And then he goes into personal and he says, and we also groan. If you've not grown, you haven't lived. If you haven't had to go, mm, mm, mm. Lord have mercy. He says, life brings groanings. It, it brings tough times and difficult times and in this world, you will have trouble. But then he comes to one of the most famous verses in the New Testament. Verse 28. He says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Everybody loves that verse. But let's spend a second in that verse, because this is all setting you up for being an overwhelming conqueror. He says, for we know, we don't think, hope, wish. He says, Paul says, let me tell you something, we know. In other words, show enough. All things are working together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. Let me read that again. All things, you'll see in a moment, that word all things is going to show up a few times. All things are working together for good. God causes them to work together for your benefit. That's good. Something beneficial. To those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The condition, here it is, for seeing God take all things and work them together for good, your benefit, is conditioned upon you loving God. All things work together for good to them who love God. In other words, let me reverse it. You may not see all things working together for good if you don't love it. But what do we mean by loving God? Jesus says in John 14 verse 15, he says, you love me if you keep my commandments. So loving, he's not talking about a feeling. He's not talking about getting juiced up on a song or liking a sermon. You love God with your feet, not merely with your feelings. So as you are going through your suffering, because everything that leads up to this is groaning. See, verse 17 down to verse 27 is all groaning, pain, difficulties, inconvenience, aches, the aches and pains of life. 
He says, while you're going through the aches and pains of life, I want you to know something. All things work together for good because God causes them to work together for good. If you love him, if you right now or when you do go through something and it is tough and difficult and hard and painful, that is the time to follow Christ more closely than you've ever followed him before. See, that's not the time to back off. That's not the time to run away. That's the time to draw near. Because all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to what he's about. God, what are you doing in allowing this thing to come into my life, to come in my way, for not letting me be able to get out of it, for not giving me release from it? What is your purpose in conforming me to Christ in this? And I'm going to love you in the middle of this. Which means I'm going to find out what you want me to do in the middle of what I'm going through. And even though I may not feel it like it, want it, or desire it, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to love you with my feet in the middle of this problem. Because I want to be a co heir Stick with me. He says, for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose in the context of this pain... God is causing something to happen. Causing. He's, he's making it happen. And what he's making happen is he's taking all things, all the different elements, good, bad, and ugly, and he is causing them to do something that they would not normally do on their own. Because if they would normally do it, he wouldn't have to cause it. He causes it because he has to make it happen. If you are baking a cake, you've got flour, you've got sugar, you've got butter, you've got nutmeg, you've got, you've got eggs, you've got different ingredients designed to bake a cake. You probably aren't going to eat any of those ingredients on their own by themselves. You're not going to eat flour by itself. You're not going to stick a, a stick of butter in your mouth by itself. You're not going to just gobble up some, some raw eggs by themselves. You're not going to just suck some uh, nutmeg out by itself because all those things unmixed are of no benefit. What you're going to do is you're going to cause those things to work together because you're going to go in your kitchen and you're going to pull out a blender. And you're going to put all those things in the blender and the blender is going to force those things to relate to each other in a way that they would never relate to each other on their own. The blender is going to force something to happen, cause something to happen that would not normally happen if you just left the items on the counter and said, why can't you all get along? You're going to have to cause that cake to come about by putting all of those ingredients in the blender, mixing them together, and then things are gonna get worse before they get better because you're gonna put a fire under them. You're gonna put this blended situation in a heated scenario. You're gonna put this blended situation in a hot environment, and all of a sudden, something that was independently of no value by themselves becomes mm -mm, good. It becomes beneficial and the smell of the cake levitates you from the back room to the kitchen because you have caused all things to work together for something beneficial that no thing would be by itself. The verse says God causes, forces, arranges, and makes Things that seemingly have no benefit, seemingly by themselves are, are not satisfied, seemingly by themselves are going nowhere. Once he puts it in his blender, for those who love him, for those who are following him in the midst of what does not seem rational, fair, what it seems problematic and difficult, he puts it in his blender and he is cooking up something. He is causing them to work together in a way that they didn't work together. In other words, 
When you have a trial over here and a problem over there and a difficulty over here and you got all this stuff sitting on the counter and by themselves you don't want to eat any of them because all you see are all these independent elements. But you add to those independent elements loving him. That is uh, seeking the obedient way to proceed in spite of the individual elements that you see. God becomes your blender. And he takes all of these independent things, problems though they may be, he puts them in his blender and begins to cook up something. He begins to cook up something that brings him glory and brings you good. That is, he is going to benefit you. Now, I know you can't see it because it's not in the blender yet. I know you can't see it because it hasn't been cooked fully yet. But when he finishes what he is about, he is cooking up something and causing things to work together for your good. Now, the beautiful thing is he's doing this with all things. Yeah, that's what the verse says. He causes all things to work together. He can take messes and create miracles. He, he, he causes all things to work together for something that is is beneficial. Now, having said that, that leads him to his section. See, everything I just said was an introduction. Because now he comes to his section and he's talking about the greatness of God in the midst of groaning. So if you're here today and you stood up because you're going, mm, 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 this, uh, this, this verse for you. If you're here today and you will be going through something, God wants you to know he is for you. That's why he raises in bulletproof, machine gun fashion in these verses, verse 31. What shall we say to these things? He raises the question. What are we going to say? His point is, if God is for you, who can be against you? If, 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 if God is going to work it out for you, who can stop him? If God is going to go ahead of you, who can hinder him? If God is fighting for you, who's going to overrule you? That's his question. He now impregnates the question with theology. He says, if God, verse 32, did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? I like that word free. In other words, he's just going to flow it to you. You don't have to go out and make it happen. You don't go out to force it to happen. Uh, 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 once, once, once you put the ingredients in a cake mix, or once you put the mix together, and you put it in the right environment, the cake's going to come. He says he's going to freely give you all things. That makes him ask another question. Who's going to bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Christ Jesus died. He rose, he seated on the right hand of the Father, and he intercedes for us. He goes before you to make sure this stuff happens. Now watch this now. As you go through the groaning of life, that's his context. If you decide to follow God in the midst of your pain, it's easy to follow him when there's no problem. It's easy to follow him when there's no challenge. But in the midst of your suffering, you are now being invited to become a co-heir, not just an heir. That is to benefit at a deeper level from the relationship. He says, when you decide to do that, God becomes your blender. And he causes all things to work together because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. His point is, if God gave you Jesus, why would he withhold something less than Jesus? He gave you the most difficult thing. He spared not his own son. Everything else is easy from there, downhill from there, and free from there. So, having set that stage up, he now comes down and he says, what will separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 35. What's that question mean? What will separate you, here it is, from the experience Experience of God's love for you. God just doesn't want you to know about his love. He wants you to feel that thing. See, you can have somebody say, I love you, and you can feel the love. Or you can just have somebody talking. He wants you to experience his love. 
When does he want you to experience? Watch this. During the extremes of life. Notice what he says. He wants you to experience it in spite of tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, pearl, or sword. I don't see anything positive in those verses. I see nothing positive. Trouble, I'm down, 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 discouraged. Stuff is coming against me, I'm persecuted. I've run low on food, famine. I've run low on clothes, naked. I'm in danger, pearl, and the sword is after me. And in the middle of all this mess, he wants me to experience the love of Christ. Now let me explain. The greatest time you will experience the reality of Christ is when life is not working, not when it is working. See, most people come to God when life is working and God says, you haven't seen me yet till life is not working. You got all these negative things coming at you. You've got one pain, one problem after another coming at you. But in all these things, I love this, all these things, we are overwhelmingly conquerors through him who loved us. God's going to show you his love during your roughest time, not just during your nicest time. He's going to show you his love during your most difficult days. So everybody who stood up today, you in a good position because you are well situated if you will follow him in your difficulty to see him show up and show out in an overwhelmingly conquering way. That's not regular. That's super unleaded. That's not normal. That's God coming and showing up. How does he show up? Notice what he says. He says, I'm convinced. Death nor life, angels nor principalities, things present, things to come, powers, height, depth, nor any other created thing. Mm. If it's been created, it shouldn't have the final say so. Okay. I bet you there has been no problem anybody in this room has ever faced that didn't come from something that was created. Okay. Nothing has ever happened to you that didn't come from something that was made. It had to exist for it to happen to you. If it existed and it happened to you, that means it was a created thing. He says, I'm convinced that none of these extremes, which includes everything in between, and it concludes every created thing, here it is, should have the final say-so in your life should have the final say-so in your situation because it cannot separate you from the experience of God's love. Now, what does it mean to be an overwhelming conqueror? Here it is. It is when you are going through the groanings and God overrules in the middle of it. You are an overwhelming conqueror because God has overruled in your situation. The Supreme Court is the final decision maker of the land. Lower courts may have made one decision, but if the Supreme Court agrees to hear it, they have the authority to override what lower courts have said. The lower court can be against you. You can have a whole series of lower courts against you. But if the Supreme Court agrees to hear the case, and if the Supreme Court is for you, then the Supreme Court can overrule the lower courts who rule against you. There are folks in this room right now where your circumstances are ruling against you, where your situation uh, is not for you where there are people who are not for you, where there are circumstances that are holding you down. That, that is a court, that's just not the Supreme Court. Because he says if God is for you, he's the final arbitrator of the situation, who then can have the final rule against you? The woman caught in adultery in John 8, Jesus said, go and sin no more. Why? Because sin had to be addressed. But once the sin was addressed and she got right with God, he told her, go and sin no more. And then he asked her a question. 
He said, now where are your accusers? There were a whole bunch of hypocrites who had accused this woman. Jesus Christ overruled the hypocrites, showed them their hypocrisy. It says they left one by one, and Jesus says, now I thought we had a whole lot of people here holding you down, holding you back, and we're gonna cancel out your future. But I stepped in the middle of that mess, and I overruled them, so I want you to go now, because I overruled the people who were gonna try to ruin you, even though it was sin. When you address the sin, and wanted to follow me, I address those who are going to hold you down. See, you can give people credit, but don't give them too much credit. Because uh, when God rules, that is the final rule, or the final say-so in your life. It is God who makes the final say-so because he is the Supreme Court. Because of the work of Christ, he is free to flow in your life and in your situation. Now I want to call your attention to something. I want you to read verse 37 real slow. Because there's a word I want to pick out of verse 37. And I want to talk about that word. Now I've talked about the unique word, overwhelming conqueror. The word that's only used this time in the New Testament or in the Bible. You're not supposed to just win, you're supposed to win big. Okay? So, you're going through something or you will be going through something. And God says, you're supposed to win, and you're supposed to win big. You're supposed to be an overwhelming victor, not a get-by person. So in other words, trying to make it, that means you're not an overwhelming conqueror yet. You doing okay? That's not an overwhelming phrase. You, uh, you, uh, you, 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 you try to get by, or you, you know different than anybody else, okay? You're not an overwhelming conqueror, okay? Uh, uh, people will say, people will say uh, you know, uh, I got... Uh, you know, I got, I got bread on my table, and I got clothes on my back, and I got a roof over my head. Well, I got, I got sinners who got bread on their table and roof over their head and clothes on their back. I, I know atheists who got bread on their table and, 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 and clothes on their back and a roof over their head. Now, that's all nice because the Bible says God reigns on the just and the unjust. But God is talking about something bigger than just what everybody else has, what everybody else can do. He's talking about something overwhelming. Now, watch this. What do you think the word is that we ought to pay attention to in verse 37? Okay, somebody said all. Well, you can't say, you in the first service. You heard me. They gave it away. I want to talk about the word in. In, in. Okay, I just want to look at that word in. He says in verse 37, but in all these things, we are overwhelming conquerors. Let me tell you what most people come to God for. They come to God to be an overwhelming conqueror from all these things. See, we come to God to take us out of this problem remove this problem, get rid of this problem. We want to be overcomers from it. He says, uh, not so fast. I'm going to show you how big and bad I am. I'm going to make you an overcomer in it. Okay? Okay? Right smack dab while you're in the middle of your mess. Right smack dab when your situation has not yet changed. We have not arrived at from yet. We still in it. He says, I'm going to make you a victor in it. In fact, let me say something I didn't say in the first service. You may not get victory from until you see victory in. See, a lot of us want victory from when God says, I want you to see what I can do in it before we get you from it because then you will know who I am to overwhelmingly give you victory while you are still stuck in the middle of the problem you're asking me to get you out of. I am going to make you an overwhelming conqueror in the middle of it. Israel was going through the wilderness. They were in the wilderness. They were hungry in the wilderness. But while hungry in the wilderness, God opened up heaven and let cornflakes from above rain down, called manna from on high. 
while they were in. He didn't take them out of the wilderness. He left them in the wilderness to see how he could overwhelmingly provide while they were in a desert situation. Before he ever took them to the promised land, he let them see what he could do in a wilderness situation. Some of you are asking God, get me out of this wilderness and take me to the promised land. God is saying, well, we're going to get there. But before we arrive at your being delivered from the wilderness, I want to show you how I can take care of you in a desert situation. I want to show you how I can meet your need. I want to show you I can, when you're thirsty, bring water out of a rock in the middle of a wilderness so that you know I can overwhelmingly supply while you are still in your situation. This is the testimony of a Christian who all their world is falling apart in their life. Their hope is gone and then God gives them a peace that passes understanding. They're supposed to be not sleeping. They're supposed to be panicking. They're supposed to be losing their natural mind. And God joins them in the middle of it before he takes them out of it in order to, in order to let them know, I'm going I'm to show you what peace looks like when there's nothing to be peaceful about. I'm going to show you what joy looks like when there's nothing to grin about. I'm going to show you what victory looks like when, there's, when you still haven't been delivered. Because then you know you're an overwhelming conqueror. You are a conqueror in spite of the situation. You will see what I can do to deliver you even in the midst of what you're going through. Listen, what Paul is saying is in the extremes of life. God will meet you in them while you're waiting for him to deliver you from them. Yes, keep praying, deliver me from it, but let me see you while I wait in it so that I can know your power and not forget it when I've been delivered from it. So I want some of you to change your prayers. Instead of just spending all your time saying, God, how long? God, take it away. God, deliver me. I want you to say, God, let me see you work while I'm waiting on you to deliver me. Let me see your presence and power while I'm still stuck in the rut and the mess and the muck and mire of my situation. Let me see what you can do while I'm waiting on the Lord. That's what it means to wait on God. It means to see God in the middle of it while you are waiting. And there's nothing like God coming through in a way that lets you know he's God even when your situation has not changed. Because then you get to see, know, and experience his reality. I don't know how many of you watch professional wrestling, WW whatever, Raw, whatever it is. But what you need to know, let me tell you a little secret about professional wrestling. The victor is decided ahead of time. Before you ever see the match, it's already declared that The Rock's gonna win, or that The Undertaker is gonna win, you know, or, or whoever they are. It's, it's decided before the match who the victor is gonna be. So they don't go into the ring wondering who's gonna win. Victory has been declared in advance. But just because victory has been declared in advance doesn't mean you're not gonna get slammed. Just because victory has been declared in advance, it doesn't mean you're not going to be thrown down. Just because victory has been declared in advance, it doesn't mean you're not going to be thrown out the ring. Just because victory has been declared in advance, it doesn't mean nobody's going to jump on you. Just because victory has been declared in advance, doesn't mean you won't get a cut or a bruise or bleed a little bit. All it does mean is what happens in the ring doesn't determine the outcome because the outcome has been determined in advance. I wish I could tell you this morning, fall in love with Jesus and you won't get slammed. I would love to tell you this morning, fall in love with Jesus and there will be no bruise. I would be pleased to tell you, fall in love with Jesus and you won't get thrown out the ring. But what I can tell you is that your victory has been declared in advance. So even though the devil is slamming you, even though people are abusing you, even though you're being thrown out of the ring, God has already decided in advance that you are more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loved you and gave himself for you. So while you're in the middle of it, here's what I want you to do. I want you to do what the Bible says. It says, in everything, give thanks. 
I want you to give thanks in spite of it. Thank you, Lord, that you've already declared me a victim. Thank you that you're my blender and you're going to stir all this stuff together for my benefit. Thank you, you've already gone ahead of me to give me my deliverance and you're going to show me how bad you are while I wait on my deliverance. Somebody ought to bless the Lord today in the middle of what you're going through, in the middle of your problem and of your pain because God loves you even though you're being bumped around in the ring of life as long as you obey him as you go through.